Okay, so we're going to start with this one. That is not, it was not actually in the list, but as the first one is not here, we'll do this like surprise talk. So please. So. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Vitaly Bochmin. Uh, I'm a software engineer at CloudLock. Um, so, and uh, today, I want to talk about how to create a Telegram bot. Because uh, yesterday there was a talk how to create a Twitter bot, and I thought, like, okay, why, why not create a Telegram one? So, uh, the first thing you need to do is you need to create a bot. And the most convenient thing is that you do not need to call your mom. Instead, uh, you just need to talk to bot father. So bot father is a, is a special Telegram bot which allows you to create and manage your bots. So you just type command new bot, answer a few questions like uh, the name of your bot, uh, the description, and that's it. And you get your token, which you then can use to build your bot application. So in pipe PUI, there are tons of different Python packages which allow you to create those bots. Like, as you can see, that it's not a complete list, but it's a huge one. Uh, in this talk, I would like to focus on the package which is called AIOTG. So this is a, a little framework built with uh, async IO which allows you to build uh, Telegram bots really easily. So the first thing you do is like you define a bot, like you, you construct your bot class. Uh, you provide a token and a name to, to, to the constructor. Then you define some commands handler uh, so that your bot can understand what, what, what it needs to do if somebody calls that hello command, for example. And, and also, you can define any other handler, any other message handler. For, like, you can define what to do in case of audio message uh, comes in, or video message, or image, or whatever message comes in. And the last thing that is left is to run your bot. So it just runs uh, a loop, like in, a, in an uh, async I.O. event loop, and it constantly pulls for the new updates from the feed. And in case of uh, a new message appear, like every message is sent to, to, to a handler that is defined to handle that um, type of message. So that's basically it. Uh, you can find the, the uh, whole source code under that GitHub uh, project name. Um, let's do some live demo. OK, thank you. Uh, the next one was supposed to be global interpreted block. Oh, well, sorry. You're going to. Yeah. That's all. Like, if there is a time, I would like to do a demo. Like. Well, yeah, you have some minutes yeah? left. Yeah. Okay. You. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's my first time. Um, hold on for a sec. How do I do mirroring? Oh, here it is. Um, do you see anything at all? 
I'll call them. So um, the, this is the, the standard Europe Python Telegram group. Uh, like you think it's okay if I invite the bot here so that everybody can look at it? Okay, so let's invite a hello AP17 bot here. It works. So yeah, if, if you go to, uh, to the repo, uh, there is a Docker file over here. Uh, you, you can compile your own Docker uh, image or you can just uh, pull this one from the Docker Hub and try it. So that's it, thank you. Thank you. Um, is here now the one who was going to do the talk about global interpreter lock? Not here? Okay. So please come to the stage and prepare yourself. And um, I need here Peter Diva. You're preparing? Okay, you have everything set up? Nice. As you may have noticed, I'm not Harald. I, I have changed a bit, you know, I have. I'm smaller, a bit more feminine, but... <laughs> uh, sorry, that was the, the sad part. They asked me to host this thing, but the first thing I thought is, I have not that many jokes, and I, have, I don't speak with that many people. So I have no histories about, yeah, just yesterday I speak with... I have no this story, so I have to just try to improvise a bit. Mostly I just speak with robots, actually. So this gives me, and they don't kind of have very interesting stories. All the stories they have, I have put them then. You ready? Uh, like it's working? Give me a second. Well, at least it's something. Just the day everything was gray. So it's an improvement. Um, also, there's uh, Miguel Beltre. Okay, ah, yeah, you were preparing. Uh, this time it's going to be smaller, so we have uh, some big uh, time constraint. But okay, yeah. Okay, so there hi everyone. Um, Let's give him a good time. <laughs> okay, so um, my name is Oz Tiram. I work for a company called Mobility House in Germany. And I want to uh, present a small uh, Python library which I think might be useful for other people too. So um, if you worked with Redis or MongoDB, you know you can put uh, um, ex expiry time for um, your keys or even uh, collections in the case of uh, MongoDB collections. And, but there are um, cases where you don't want to bound, bind your application to a... Um, um, database or you can't even because you work in a very limited environment. So I was uh, looking for a solution for quite a, a long time and I didn't know what to do so I found out that there's something called time to leave dictionary which is was not really maintained. Um, so I forked it and um, there's now a PyPy package available. The, the, Repository, repository in GitHub is also available, and I want to show you a small little demo, if you may give me the opportunity. I just need to get a terminal running.
uh, yeah. Yes. Is the contrast good enough on the uh, screen? No. Okay. So, is this better? Bigger, bigger, bigger. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, the uh, library contains simply just one thing, an order dictionary which remembers the order of your uh, keys and values and accepts an expiry time. So. If I create it like this, with the three seconds values, and put a value in there. Now, I have this key, and if I will wait a few seconds and I will try to get it, I get a key error because three seconds have passed and it's expired. So just to show this again, quickly, it's there. It's gone. And the nice thing about it is no threads, no magics. Please don't use it for thousands of values. It's only nice uh, for very small amounts on the order of like a couple of thousands. So you can use it for kind of like a cache or I don't know, whatever you, use, you see for this. Thank you. I keep forgetting that I have a microphone. Uh, so he's going to set up now. And I, I think I have something to, to improve my jokes. I find on the internet and I found uh, this bug jokes bot. So as I don't have them, I may have Right, I rate them. Like the first one is I've been using Beam for a long time now, mainly because I can't figure out how to exit. Now you're supposed to laugh, please. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. And now just give them give a big plaque so for Python. <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, I will be talking about a little bit about tooling for workshops. So. Who has ever attended as a student the uh, PyLadies, Django Girls, Women Code, Digger Girls, PyCode, etc.? Uh, raise your hand up, please. No, three, four. Oh, I've expected more. So, who has a mentor during those workshops? Please raise your hand. More, that's nice. And who has organizing or helping organizers to uh, execute the workshops? Two, three, four. Okay, that's less than I expected. So, for those who don't know, it goes like that. First, we recruit the, um, the students and the mentors. Um, then, uh, organization team handles at the same time stuff like PR, marketing, funding, etc. Uh, but honestly, we are having problems with managing everything at one place, especially if we go at scale. And in Poznan, I can be proud of, we had like 220 students and weekly sessions for some time. It dropped out. Uh, it dropped a little bit in the time, uh, so we finished with like like 100 students at the end after 30 weeks of uh, classes, and it's hard to manage that amount of um, amount of uh, students without proper tooling. So, what we are using for PyLadies and also Django Girls in Poznan, it's Google Docs, Google Forms, Trilo or Asana, Facebook, Sphinx or PowerPoint for passing that knowledge and a lot of smaller stuff. So I was thinking that if all of our groups of Django girls over the world have the similar problem, and from what I heard they have, uh, we can uh, adjust the uh, necessary tooling for uh, removing for example, Google, Google Doc Forms uh, for recruitment, uh, which is especially uh, not nice when reviewing the recruit recruitment process. And also, we are having issues with the storing the material, which is mostly on uh, order GitHub, with, which is not so good for not savvy users, uh, tech savvy. And uh, uh, we could also uh, use some more stuff. Uh, we had first approach uh, on the um, PyCode Carrots uh, event. We, I've built our reg registration app, which allowed you to register and review the users. It helped us a lot, especially we had over 900 um, people who wanted to join us. 
And what the UX of that and the design is awful because I did it like in 24 hours, uh, just not to use the Google Forms. So I would like to invite you to share your ideas, what you need, what do you expect for an application to handle the workshops today uh, in two hours, so 14.55 or 2.35 uh, 2 p.m. Uh, American time to break out free room uh, when we can create a backlog of the features we would like to see an application that would help us uh, do the workshops uh, next time. Thank you for your attention and see you in two hours. Thank you, and there's Beth Nuttall here, okay, so go prepare, and Miguel Beltre, just, okay, move, move, we have not that much time. <laughs> He's going to speak about packed Python, cool, yeah. why not? So I think that I have not introduced myself, I'm Leire, more known as the mother of robots, yes. um, You'll probably find me in the reception desk. Please don't do that. Uh, are you okay. ready? Now I cannot see what I'm doing. No, no. Well, at least we're yeah. seeing something. OK. <laughs> People's getting nervous. They want to go lunch, you know? But it's OK. Uh, what is so happening with this? Yep. OK. You there? Two seconds. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> oh, can you ask uh, her, please? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I cannot give that yeah. much information right now. So, you're ready? Okay, that's cool. not how it is supposed so to look. <laughs> let's clap a bit. <laughs> okay. I don't know what happened there, but. That first line is supposed to say, pack Python. <laughs> and yeah, I'm Miguel Belter, and I, wor I work for Babylon Health, a company, healthcare company, digital AI based in London. And this is like, the, can you see that? OK. Yeah, well, like it says, integrated tests are a scam, a self-replicating virus that threatens the very health of your code base, your sanity, and probably your life. I'm not a big fan of integrated tests. <laughs> um, this is a quote by J.B. Reins Bergen. So the solution to this is to do consumer-driven contract testing. Um, this is a pattern to evolve uh, your services, basically. Uh, with this technique or system, what you do is that you have an API and you publish your documentation, and every time someone is using that API, they will, they will generate a contract and then they will send that contract to you, and then you can validate that contract every time you are, oh, I'm really nervous. <laughs> every time you are building your service, you validate that contract, and then you can make sure that you're not breaking your clients. Um, the thing is that sometimes you are expecting clients to use your API in one way, but they, then they start to use it in different ways that you didn't know they could, but they are still doing it. And when you have many clients, it's really important that you don't break them every time you update your API. So basically, this is a way to try to avoid that. The system is really simple. You have a consumer that will generate a contract and publish it to a common place. And then you have the provider that will download that contract and validate the contract for different consumers. This is like the simple structure. Uh, well, the library pack Python is just a Python implementation of the pack uh, standard, let's say. So it's language that uh, the standard is language independent. It works right with microservices. Uh, you can move fast and, make, and be sure that nothing is going to break. Um, I don't know if you have the problem of, like, when you have, like, 20 microservices and you need to do integrated tests. Trying to orchestrate that on a CI is really difficult. I've been in that hell many times. And this is definitely a way to get out of it. And yeah, throw away integration tests. Uh, if you want to check out the library, because this is like, in five minutes, I cannot tell you everything about it, you can visit the 
website. They will tell you everything you need to know. Um, yeah, this is the, the website. You will find everything here. Um, all the libraries for the different languages, Python, Java, everything. So it doesn't matter if you're using many languages in your company, you can always use that. The Python library is actually in active development. We definitely need people to get involved. Um, if you can give us a hand, that would be great. Thank you. Cool. So Ben, just go there. Um, Adrian? Adrian is, OK, just set up your computer really quick. Ben is going to speak to us about we don't know what, because the deal is the title will give away the talk. So it's supposed to be super short, I guess. You ready? Yep. There you go. OK. So uh, my name is Ben. I work for the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, and giving this talk a title would have kind of given away the contents of the talk. So I haven't given it one. Um, so I do a lot of Python on Raspberry Pi. And so I do a lot of things like this. So pip install numpy. Uh, the way this works is uh, it browses pipi.python.org slash simple slash numpy, looks for a wheel file with a platform tag matching the current platform. If it finds a match, it downloads the wheel and installs it, and it takes no time. That's what the wheel platform, uh, the, the wheel uh, standard in, in Python is for, uh, providing pre-built binaries of, of these packages. If they're implemented in C, you, you don't have to rebuild that when you download it. If no match is found for the platform that you're on, if, they only provide, if you're on a, um, a Linux machine, 64-bit, and they only provide, say, Windows 32, Windows 64, then you don't have a match. You have to build um, the thing from source, uh, the package from source. And if they don't provide any source uh, along with um, their wheels and things, then you, you fail. You, you can't install it at, at all. So, uh, if I type, if I go back and type pip install numpy, um, and it says, well, which type of x86 or 64 are you? I have them all. So this is what numpy provides, although these are all their different platform wheels for their different versions of Python and different um, combinations of all of that. Uh, and it's saying, well, which one are you? Actually, I'm Linux ARM v7L. That's my platform. Uh, and it's like, what? I've never heard of that. Um, here's the source. Build it yourself. And this takes a long time. So it takes a reasonable amount of time on a laptop, but uh, on a Raspberry Pi, uh, Pi 3 takes about 20, 30 minutes. Um, and on a Pi 1, it takes two and a half hours. So really, um, uh, with a single core, very, uh, qu quite, quite, uh, quite a slow clock speed, takes a long time to build. So just running pip install numpy or pip install anything that relies on numpy, you'll be sitting on waiting a long time. So I kind of thought, well, fine, I'll build my own package repository. Um, so PyWheels is essentially the name of the project and the name of the talk. Um, so I have a Py3 in my, in my living room um, that builds, um, that gets a list of all the packages on PyPy, and there were 106,000 at the time. And I just sat there, iterated, iterated over that list, building wheels of all the packages, or attempting to. I log all the output from um, the build process uh, into a database so that I can uh, look back later and see why certain things failed or, or look at any information there, there is there. And then on the same Pi, I just host a web server. And the very minimal you need, the min minimum you need to do to host a Python package repository that will work with, um, with pip is um, a, a directory listing of all the directories uh, with the package names containing the wheels or, uh, or other types of package distributions. So that's literally all I do. I have a Raspberry Pi. Um, running Raspbian, derivative of Debian, um, with an Apache web server just hosting the files that it's built. Um, so this, is on, uh, this was on GitHub, um, but it wasn't particularly sort of friendly as an open source project in terms of you couldn't exactly git clone this and sort of set it up and build it for your, um, you know, test it out for yourself and try and contribute, but, um, but it was there. Um, and it took 10 days to complete the build run, so all 106,000 packages. It was just the pie was just sitting there for 10 days in my living room, just building, building, and building. And I, I managed to successfully build 76% of those packages. And the, the repository is live at piewheels.bennotl.com. And now pip install numpy, if you provide um, the, the URL of the server, it works. 
and it takes six seconds instead of half an hour or two and a half hours. Um, so V2 of Pi Wheels um, is a, a Pi 3 in the data center. So there's a company called Mythic Beasts who provide Raspberry Pi 3 hosting. You can rent a Raspberry Pi uh, for six pounds a month. And so I'm using one of those. Um, I, and rather than build the latest version of every package, I'm building every version of every package. And I'm, again, I'm hosting uh, the repository on the Pi. This build, build run is likely to take a lot longer, but um, uh, uh, it's, I'm, I'm going to have to resolve a, uh, come up with a solution for that. Um, there's a test suite and installation instructions and developer documentation on GitHub as well, so uh, do take a look at that. I need to complete the build backlog, um, continue to build all releases, try to fix anything that failed and look at things like that, rebuild for different Python versions, and see if we can, in, in Raspbian, actually uh, configure pip to use this as an additional index so that users get PyWheels for free without uh, needing to know about it. Um, just last, last quick thing before I finish is um, somebody came across this project and uh, asked the, the, um, the developers of the next gen PyPy project if they would um, allow uploading ARM wheels uh, and they accepted that so you can now upload ARM platform wheels to the next gen PyPy and they appear on the, uh, the main PyPy website. So take a look at the, the GitHub project if you're interested and come and talk to me. Thank you. Okay, seems that it has been some kind of uh, misunderstanding. So we have two uh, lists for the, um, for the lighting talk sessions. We're going to uh, try to unify them, but the one with the small one, so Christian Barra, Victor, and Joao, we're going to be the last ones. Uh, now Adrian is going to speak to us about beautiful Django. Also, it's here, Tom. Um, who wants to speak about building the indie web? Yep, so if you can come here and configure everything. There you go, you, you prepare? You ready to go? No, uh, not yet. No, nope. not yet. So also, we are having, oh, yep. We're having so a bit more talks than time, so we're going to do a survey later, because now we're going to hear about Adrian. Hi, everyone. I want to talk to you about uh, beautiful Django, and it's a bit of a, a call for help. Uh, so first, um, who here used Django? Raise hand. OK. Uh, and who has read beautiful code? Oh, cool. So uh, it's quite an old book now, but the idea is each chapter is written by a different person. Uh, the subject is completely free. It could be tech-related or about documentation, about uh, an internals of any technology. Um, and the aim is to illustrate uh, what a beautiful code is. So with Beautiful Django, which is a book for and from the community, I uh, wanted to do the exact same thing. Um, so right now it's not going really good because uh, it's still the beginning. I'm lacking some time and money to launch this project. Uh, sounds like a real life project anyway. Uh, what we have so far, we have a GitHub repo. You can find it on, on uh, GitHub, beautiful Django. Uh, we have a website, manifesto, code of conduct, a diversity statement. Uh, we already have some developer ready to help. Uh, one reviewer, uh, we also have some good feedback right now. Um, so, but I still need you, so all you can help. Maybe you could provide a chapter, uh, help with the editing, spreading the word, uh, uh, giving help for reviews, uh, giving some feedbacks, uh, and anything else you can think about. Um, Last but not least, maybe Django isn't the right subject. Maybe the, this idea would be better if used with uh, Python. Maybe you can talk to me about it later. And if you need any more info or contact information, you can go on beautifuldjango.com. Uh, I'm leaving over Python today, so please just send me an email. Thank you. I think that it's officially lunch time now, so I'm going to ask. 
you want to go to still see the lights, the lighting talks that are left? Do you? How many of you want to sacrifice a bit of the lunch time? No one? One? Okay, <laughs> it's a bit sad. Anyway, um, well, we'll continue until there's no one left, probably. <laughs> yeah, that works. So, <laughs> Rad Shiorba, um, can you prepare yourself? And now we're going to hear about building the indie web. Just oh. Hello, I'm Tom. I'll try not to keep you from your lunch for too long. Um, so I'm going to talk about the IndieWeb. It's a community I've been involved in for a while. Um, it's trying to build an alternative to commercial social networks in a simple way. Why would you want to do that? Have any of you used any of these services? Please put your hands up. Right, you're not using them anymore because they're all dead. Um, if you've uploaded photos to them, they're gone. If you've uploaded location to them, they're gone. Blog posts, community, forum posts, all gone. They've been sunsetted. Which is another way for saying, deleting all your stuff. Uh, they will have probably written a blog post which contains the sentence, thank you for being part of our incredible journey, which translates for, we got acquired, we're now rich, we're deleting all your stuff. Um, the commercial social networks have some other issues too. They uh, can be a bit overly censorious. Um, 2014, Instagram deleted a picture of a newlywed gay couple kissing because they determined it was inappropriate. Uh, Facebook routinely removes photos of breastfeeding and mastectomy scars because they're apparently pornography. Um, this seems bad. So uh, I'm part of a community that's trying to build alternatives to this uh, called the Indie Web. Um, we have this radical idea that you should uh, put stuff on the web. Um, and that maybe if we work together, we could build something that's better or more interesting than the, than the existing corporate social, own, social web. Uh, so we have a few simple principles. Publish on your own site and then syndicate to the existing networks. So a lot of people will publish on their own site and syndicate out to Twitter or Facebook. Um, the HTTP and HTML is kind of enough. We don't need lots of complicated protocols because nobody understands them. Um, we reject all this stuff around like federation and identity because it's way too complicated and you need a PhD to understand it and we've all been on mailing lists where people have argued about this stuff for years and nothing ever happens. Um, and you can implement it however you like. So long as there's a web page, that's kind of all you need. So I do it in Django, some people do PHP, some people do WordPress, Node.js, whatever. Uh, we're against monoculture. Um, Diversity in implementation is good. Uh, we've built some very lightweight protocols because all of the existing ones were bonkers. Um, the, we've got three or four of them which are now on the standards track, uh, MicroPub, which is kind of an alternative to all those nasty old XML RPC post to your, post to your blog APIs. WebMention, which is kind of a way to syndicate replies back to your site. Um, and uh, yeah, we'd like to be involved. It's, it's a cool community and we're building stuff. Uh, we've got events coming up this year in uh, Berlin and in Dortmund. Um, in San Francisco, Baltimore, Brighton, London and Berlin, we have uh, bi-weekly clubs for people to come along and, and chat. And we have an IRC channel, which I didn't mention on there, which is hashtag, uh, which is a channel IndieWeb on Freenode. Um, so yeah, we'd like to get involved. It's, it's kind of a cool community. You can come and chat to me afterwards if you like, or just go to indieweb.org. I um, hope that's interesting. So, Rad, can you... Uh, uh, okay, there you are. And uh, Pavel, Pavel Shoroshenko. Is that many people moving that I cannot identify Pavel? Is there someone? Oh, there you are. So, okay, just, um, there's going to be someone left. Just, uh, okay, the resistance, nice. Uh, so, you ready or you need some few um, minutes? Yeah, I think I'm good. Let's see if the projector can do full HD. So, let's make more noise as we are few. Is that visible? 
good enough. So, hi, um, I'm Radu. I'm going to show you a quick thing. Um, so, first of all, who am I? Um, I work for this company called Press Labs. We do, I'm, I'm a software developer, do operations there. We host WordPress. One of the biggest problems, well, other than the fact that we run other people's PHP code, is that we run our own CDN um, for hosting. So ideally, we want when someone wants to access one of our uh, hosted sites, when, they, when you do a lookup, you want to take you to the closest, the lowest latency edge um, we've got. And we want DNS to s do this for us. Um, sorry, that's a bit cut off, but I'm not going to fiddle with the projector now. Um, we also want to have some redundancy, so like you've got multiple edges in geographic locations and we also want to make sure we load balance, like um, we specify weights and uh, we, we basically, through DNS, make sure that um, requests hit all edges in a certain geographical er uh, location. Uh, now we could use Route 53's policy records for this. They do exactly this. However, they cost about, I, I think I put up euros, they're actually US dollars, but still 50 US dollars per record, which if you got like, you know, the Apex WW CDN domains adds up to about $150 just for the DNS for one customer, which is ridiculous. We couldn't pass that cost onto our computer. So um, the solution, um, actually, if you have a look at how AWS implements those policy records, they document it pretty well, and they let you basically kind of roll your own. Um, it's just a set of aliases with, you specify latency in which location. Um, so we roll our own. It's called Zinc. It's open source. It's in Python trees. has got a simple REST API. Pretty good testing, I think. And uh, let me show it off. So. Um, quick demo time. Like this is, this is, if you see here, like this is the CDN record for um, a demo site. You can see it's just an alias, an alias to all of this top level records. Now, if you go in and change, like I want to change the policy. Um, switch it over to some different policy and you will see that, there we go. It's now saying it's not sync. We gotta wait a while for a reconcile loop to basically solve this problem for us. There we go, it's now green. And if I refresh here, hey, and I've got a very simple different policy now with only one IP. Um, there is a REST API. We've got Swagger, you can check it out. There's documentation and all that on GitHub. You can check out the code here. And that's it. If you need this, please use it. Thank you. Cool. So now, uh, Pavel, just connect here. And Vita, Vita is here. Uh, oh, cool. So can you come here and configure your Okay, so um, he's going to speak about faster testing. Yeah. Is that right? Cool. So Hello. there you go. Hi, this is my first ever talk and first lightning talk, so hope it goes well. I'm going to do a live demo as well. <laughs> but I'll keep it short. So hi, I'm Pavel. Um, I'm not sure the right audience. Who here uses Sublime Text? All right, we've got some people here. Good. Who writes tests? A lot more. Yay. Great. So I'm going to show you something. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there it goes. All right. So can you see this? A bit? OK. So we've got a little project here. It's uh, got some work that needs to be done. There, there's a couple of. Uh, functions that do work, and there's a test module. So it tests the work, but it's a bit slow, and we need to wait for it. So, uh, so usually what we do, yeah, as we write PyTest here, for instance, uh, if you use PyTest for testing, it's good. And then you wait basically for all the tests to finish, and some of them might not be as fast as you wish to do it. So you keep waiting and waiting, and yeah, you see a lot of fails, which is uh, 
which is why we have the this slide. <laughs> All of them failed. And let's see. Yeah, that's not going to work really good. Oh well. So there is a better way to do that. We know that. So what we usually do is uh -huh, we write PyTest and then give us a specific module and then run that module. It also takes time. And while it takes time, I don't have any jokes or anything, so we basically wasted lots of time and we failed again. So uh, yeah, well, probably we should fix some of these. So here maybe we do, yeah, lightning equals lightning, maybe. Hopefully that's right. Python is larger than awesome and, and you rock at least a lot. Well, this probably works. I, didn't, I actually didn't get there that far. So yeah, so you could run a specific module, any specific test, I'm sure you know that. So for instance, uh, let's run just this test. Yay, it's much faster because you just ran one test. So everyone knows you should run as few tests as possible, right, when you iterate and work. And it also passes. So we could, uh, um, <laughs> so we, we basically, this is basically a plug for my plugin that I uh, built for this thing, which basically allows you to uh, run a specific test in Sublime by basically just going to the right location and you just build the right test. Uh, you could also build the whole module or the whole project. And since these past tests pass, we have another slide. Wait, this is not before. Wait, ah, this is going really well. <laughs> and all tests pass, yay. <laughs> all right, thank you. That's basically it. Oh, sorry. That's the most important part, of course. I see. Hold on, the link. That's not what you do. Right. And here's the link. So it's a very sad project, just four stars, so go ahead and start it. One of them is mine. So thank you very much. It's, yeah. Anyone else wants to talk? Does anyone else go, uh, gonna talk? Yeah, we have uh, four talks. Nice, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and even, I think that at the end we're going to have like four attendees too, so it's cool. Um, so Vita and Victor, can you prepare the... Okay, Vita is going to speak about Big Book Asanku. Uh, yep. Um, well, it's going to be to a very selected audience. So I think that's good. We're like, uh, now it's more like homely, you know, cozy. Oh. It's you're all, you ready? Yeah, almost. You have to be fast. They are hungry. They're, I'm hungry they're too. not afraid of eating you. I'm hungry too. I'm ready. <laughs> yes. There you go. Hi. So, <laughs> uh, who here uses async IO? One person? Two? Who here wants to learn async IO? Everyone, of course, everyone. Uh, so here's an even sadder project. It has one star, but uh, it's sort of a tutorial how you can build an async IO application. And it teaches you to build uh, an ASCII video player so you can play movies in your terminal because everybody, of course, wants that. So uh, this is a small repository that uh, shows you how you build an async IO server that can stream data to multiple clients. So you connect to it with Telnet and it plays movies for you in the terminal. So you might want to check this out if you want to see how to, how to use async IO. There's like five or six tags uh, which lead you step by step through the development of this. Uh, so here's the link again and that's all from me. Thank you. He keep it short for us. So let's clap harder. Okay, now Victor is going to go on stage, and Anna is pretty much prepared. Yep. So no problem. Okay, the last one is going to be 
Joao Jr. is here. No. Cool, then we have even less. We're going to go eating soon. I'm not sure if you are realizing this, but I'm really hungry. Right. You ready? Yep. Cool. Mm, oh, no? Good. Yep. Okay. So you're going to do the first one? Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Anna. She's Anna, not, uh, sorry. I just, she's Anna, not Dick, Victor. Just I'm to doing make sure first. of this. <laughs> so. Mine is very quick. Go to this URL take my survey, I need more responses, I'm doing a community research project, and I will be publishing results next year, but I really need people to take this survey, as many different people as possible, and I'm not collecting any private information, I promise, I swear. Uh, I'm just trying to get the word out there, so please go there and then retweet the link so that other people take it, and thank you. And your turn. Now, Victor's going to speak about keyboard UX fairy tale. Yeah. Cool. And it's the last one. So clap really, really hard, please. So, hello, everyone. Uh, who attended for yesterday's talk about uh, different languages and hardcore with keyboards? Yeah, cool. So it's ended up that uh, in most operating systems, you have the compose key, and you should learn how to use it, because like compose key to rule all the diacritic stuff in all languages. So I want to take you to the hardcore travel to different group of languages where all the stuff does not help. Uh, so that's how it's named in originally, and that's how it's used in Hollywood and in normal English. So Kirillic group of languages and Kirillic script. Uh, so if you Google a little bit for how it looks and what it, what it is, uh, you may find out this Venn diagram uh, that says that, OK, like the bottom of it is actually like, probably Russian, or oh, anyway, some Kyrill language, and it's kind of similar to uh, Latin and kind of similar to Old Greek, uh, which is not the case. Uh, in reality, uh, the worst case of Kyrill language is there is no diacritic as idea. Uh, so probably, if you, yeah, if you can see uh, this. Uh, like these letters, this letter is not the letter with diacritic on the top of it. It's actually different. Uh, the same goes for all other. And uh, if you need more hardcore, the uh, letters that looks almost the same as uh, Latin one is different. And yes, there's no unique calculation for that. They're totally different. And the keyboard layout is different too. Uh, which is, yeah, super great for people who use it. And if you think it's bad enough, uh, no. Uh, all, this, uh, uh, all this script uh, came after and changed this one. Uh, super easy, I guess. Uh, so, uh, the idea, help be the global standards. If you know what the Unicode collation is, use it. If you know what Unicode is, use it. Uh, if you don't, learn about it, it's great. Uh, Next, the, even if this is not the worst part, uh, keyboard error comes to like, people who use the Kyrillic. And uh, if you ever saw the people who use keyboard and speak Russian, Ukrainian, some Kyrillic language, uh, you may know that they're using kind of the same keyboards as uh, people who use Latin-based uh, languages. So uh, 103 uh, keys for, de uh, for default keyboards and uh, Kirill languages have more, uh, more letters than most Latin one. So 33, kind of more than 26 uh, in average. So rest in peace, all the special symbols on keyboard. So all of the symbols you can see, uh, you actually cannot type them if you're using any Kirill keyboard out there. And if you're a developer or if you're using any program languages, yeah, you have no curly braces, uh, square brackets, and all, the, all of that stuff. So super handy, I guess. Uh, more of the hardcore, uh, if you ever saw the Kirillic keyboard, you can see the small key with dot and comma. And the comma in all the Kirillic layouts is an uppercase. So to input the comma, you need to click shift and dot. And if you know something about languages, comma is more common than dot. So super bad design, if you think about it a bit. Uh, so second idea, if you develop in something that probably will stay around for more than one day, uh, think a lot of it because uh, 
the moment you release something global, it will stay for a long time. And sometimes you can roll it back. Uh, if you like, ever heard of changes in probably string model in Python 3.6, uh, you may know a lot of bad design came into that, which cannot be rolled back because it's already in mainstream. Um, and the third idea. Uh, if you're interested in such stuff, read the book called The End of Average by Todd Ross, uh, the guy, actual statistician who worked for US military in Second World War, uh, who actually one of the first people who understood that uh, average uh, ideas, like you take hundreds of people, make the average of any measurement, and say, okay, the mean average is best of all. Uh, this idea is actually sucks. And uh, from the time that people saw of that, uh, like this leads to uh, like, I know, thousands of pilots in US uh, military air forces died in Second World War II because all the uh, pilot cockpits was developed by average metrics of all pilots. And this was like hell for everyone uh, from the point of usability. Uh, so, going back to uh, latent keyboards. Uh, if you're a developer, then in most cases, any keyboard layout out there is bad for you because it was developed for people who using the typewriter to type the text. Uh, and source code is different than text. So, uh, what I can propose for you, analyze the text you're typing and see how good your keyboard and your layout uh, how, it's, how well it's suited for your work. Uh, you can analyze with a lot of software that can actually make the heat maps for your keyboard uh, while you type in real time or with your actually typed source code. Or you can use Python collection counter uh, with your source code to understand which sim what symbols are more usable for you. And you see that any keyboard layout you're using is super bad for you. So what can you do about it? If you use Microsoft Windows, you can use MS KLC, which stands for Microsoft Keyboard Layout C uh, Creator. Uh, super easy tool that uh, can actually build any layout for you. Uh, so let's say you can move your curly braces and uh, square brackets somewhere in the middle of your keyboard to not make your pinky crimp. Uh, the same goes for Linux with uh, X Thanks for your time. That's all? Yeah. Yeah, well. That's it.